Chris Corgan, Anderson, Holland, Jimmy Gray, Chesley Peterson, Gus Damon, Oscar Coyne, Dan and Tim with my squad at the moment, who are Milton Miller, I forgot his name, and then Strickland. They were all in the 71 Higgins squadron. And Jesse Peterson was really the commander of 71 Higgins squadron. And then later on, when we turned over to the 4th Fighter Group, he became deputy commander and then eventually commander of the 4th Fighter Group. He was the 22-year-old full colonel. Yeah, correct. <laughs> and then uh, Jesse, after he transferred into the Air Force, you know, he ended up as a major general. And uh, he lived in Riverside, and that was the best way. And he was very He's buried at the uh, Riverside National. How many missions do you feel like you flew with the, when you were in the 71 Squadron? Uh, not too many. I would say about uh, 10 to 15. And they were all? Yeah, a bit more than 15. No, but I, I was thinking about the other squadron. Yeah. Close to 20, 20 missions. And those were those were all low level. Low level. Yeah. When they switched over to the U.S. Army Air Force. At the end of September 1942, what happened to these gentlemen? What happened? Where did they all go? Okay, initially, the 8th Air Force had plans to break up all three squadrons and send the pilots to newly arriving fire squadrons from the U.S. But Peterson told General Spatz, General, we do not like that. We like to stay as a unit. And if we don't do that, he said, we'd rather stay in the RAF. So the 8th Fighter Command or 8th Air Force, you know, evaluated Peterson's uh, demand and they said, okay, we'll leave you alone. And that's how we formed the 4th Fighter Group. And all three squadrons stay in the 4th Fighter Group. So 71 Squadron became? 334. 334. 121 became 335 and 133 became 336. Okay, and so those fellows all ended up? Yeah. Flying with you at P-47s eventually. Yes. Or, right. Were any of them? Did all of them survive the war? Except, yeah. Except uh, uh, this fellow, uh, Gray. Gray did. Oh, this is Gray here. He did want to transfer over to the U.S. Air Force. He wanted to stay in the RAF, and he stayed in the RAF. And after, of course, the war was over, he came home. And squadron, end of August, and then 30 days later, you're now in the American Air Force. Now, were you sworn in before you joined the American Air Force? Uh, as uh, became a citizen just before that, yeah. or the rule? The rule for the transfer was that you will be transferred and be given the equal rank you had in the RAF. You're going to go through a physical and an interview in London. Right. Every one of us had to go to London, and that's how we all went. And funny, you know, I procrastinated from going to London. And one, uh, one day, uh, I was going through the officer's club through the back of the building, and uh, Chesley Peterson happened to be, he said, uh, have you been to London for the interview? I said, uh, no, sir, I don't think, you know, they would uh, take me, you know, because I'm not an American, sir. When he says, you better get down to London, you know, because General Sparks told me that they want every one of us, and includes you. So I was forced to go down to London, go through the interview, and, uh, and there were three colonels sitting at this was at a building next to the American Embassy in London. Uh, I think it was headquarters in Tusa, European Theater of Operations. It was just uh, started. Anyway, I, I, I went into that interview facing three colonels there, and the first thing, the one in the middle, said to me, he's part of my accent, you know, and he said, uh, you're not an American, are you? I said, no, sir. What nationality did I tell him? I was born in Greece and so on. And uh, they chit-chatted among themselves, you know, and uh, after some more questions. And then all of a sudden, the man in the middle, Colonel Henry Stover, I remember his name, he said, young man, you accept a commission as a second lieutenant in the American Air Force. I was not happy, but I was in cloud nine immediately, you know. I said, you mean, I'll be? oh, yes, sir, we need you. That's how I was taken into the American Air Force without being in America. Hmm. And thank to Chesley Peterson, in 19, on the 3rd of May, 1943, uh, Pete was a good friend of uh, Ambassador John Wayne, And uh, 
This is what Pete told me later on. And I went to see John and I told him, I said, I got a Greek boy in the group, fourth fighter group, and uh, who's not an American? Uh, what do I have to do to sponsor him? And I, I'll be glad to be the sponsor and so on to make him an American. So uh, the ambassador said, uh, Pete, you don't have to do anything. The Congress just amended the Nationality Act whereby any foreigner who is serving in the U.S. Armed Forces, and who is not an American, and wishes to become an American, the only thing you have to do is just raise the right hand and say, I do, in front of a designated uh, representative from the Department of State. And that's what happened when uh, Dr. Henry Hazard, a special emissary, arrived in London to naturalize about less than a dozen of us who were serving without being American. Following on from the Lafayette Escadrille, yes. that the Lafayette Escadrille pilots, if they shot somebody down, they would unbutton the top tunic, the top button of their tunic. Did the this Eagle Squadron... This was an RAF uh, technique. Right. Did the, did the Eagle Squadron guys do that Absolutely. too? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. In order to tell the people that we were not bomber pilots, to distinguish, you know, that you were a fighter pilot to unbutton your uh, top button. So it just being a fighter pilot allowed you to, to undo. But, but let me say this though, uh, while we transferred over, we began to do that in American uniforms. And I'll never forget where we had a general from 8th Fighter Command visit at uh, Depton Aerodrome and he saw us in a mess. Well, some of us were in uniform and of course we had button on button and uh, the general told him, you know, you're out of uniform, but not. He didn't like the idea. So we just abandoned that idea. Now, is Debden still open? Uh, no. In fact, I just visited Debden. I was down at uh, Daxford at the air show uh, last month. Right. And uh, no, at the beginning of this month, July 13, 14. And I had a chance to go to Debden, and uh, it has converted to a bomb disposal outfit. And the aerodrome is just abandoned, and uh, the hangars are uh, rusty. And but but I went to the main building. It's still, it's basically still there. Yeah, the main building. I encountered a sergeant up in the front, and I told him I identified uh, who I was. And uh, in fact, I had with me my, uh, I still have my RAF ID card. Really? And I saw it to the sergeant, and he saluted me. Uh -huh. And uh, he wow. says, how can I help you? I said, I used to be stationed here and, uh, and I'd like to look at the building. So he took me into the building then and I got the officer's club exactly the same way as it was then. The dining room, two big tables, you know, left and right and unbelievable. Unbelievable. I noticed in your book you mentioned several times that uh, before a flight you had to breathe a lot of oxygen. Oh yeah. I think that had something to do with the night before, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, correct. <laughs> You st well, first of all, you started out in when you went, you came out here to California, to uh, nice flight academy. to the flight academy. And then I you went to, to England. I went through the officers' training course, and then after that, I went to an operational training unit. Okay. And then, open graduation from the operational training unit, I went to. I was assigned to the two six eight fight squad. Now why? Now why two six eight? Because you were a Greek citizen. Uh, they put probably, yeah, probably, yeah. Uh, I, I think the RAF looked at it, you know, this guy is not an American, you know, but uh, right. don't send him there. However, while I was with 268 Squadron, I ran into a major problem. The Greek Air Force in, in exile, while in London, uh, were looking to gather escaped Greek pilots when the Germans invaded Greece. Many of the pilots, you know, had escaped to Cyprus, to Malta, North Africa and some here in England. So then this uh, week commander in London who was in charge of gathering Greek pilots for a Spitfire squadron they were planning to organize in Africa, he went to the Air Ministry and got a roster of current aviators in the RAF and picked up the Greek names. That's how they really found me. I, I was not connected with the Greek Air Force at all. So I was called and uh, I was told that uh, they were going to take me away from the RAF and send me to Egypt to join this uh, Spitfire squadron. I didn't want to go to Egypt. So I went to see Chesley Peterson and uh, I had met, of 
course, and he wanted me to join the 71. Well, didn't you, you ran into him, didn't you? I mean, you, oh, yeah, you accidentally, London. yeah, yeah you ran into him in London. In London, I went to the Eagle Club, and right. Mrs. Dexter, you know, said, Laddie, Pete is here in town, he has left the telephone number. She got him on the phone, and I talked to him on the phone, and we met at the Regent Palace. Okay, there. now, so now in 268, you were flying Mustangs. Mustangs, P correct. P-51A. Correct. Okay. Mustangs with the Allison engine. And this was with the, what they call it, the Army Support Group or something like that? Yeah, something like that, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we were flying over, I, I think I flew about eight or nine missions over Holland, strafing trains and postal uh, boats, German boats there. Is that fun to strafe a train? Yeah. And <laughs> when then, it blows up. <laughs> then I told Peterson, you know, what was happening with the Greek Air Force. He said, well, do you want to go to Richard? I said, no, sir. I want to stay here. And if I survive the war, I'm going to go back to the States and become an American. He says, okay, I'll, let me take him about it. I'm on my way to fighter command today, and uh, I'm going to bring this up. So you got transferred, yeah. and they they approved the transfer. Oh, so yeah, then you went yeah. to the, then but you the went funny to. Part, the funny part, initially, this guy at uh, fighter command, you know, he says we can't do that. If the Greeks want to get the guy, they. But then Peterson says, wait a minute, wait a minute. You spend more than fifty thousand dollars to train this guy as a fighter pilot, and now you are to release him to go to Egypt to a squadron that does not exist. That doesn't make sense. Finally, Pete uh, persuaded the uh, fighter command to uh, do something about it. So they agreed. They said, let's get Pisanos today out of 268 to 71, and orders will follow. And if the Greeks want to get him, they have to deal with Peterson. And Peterson was going to say, you know, nothing doing. This guy is, he's going to be an American or so. And of course, he was the one who helped, you know, become an American. So you actually entered the 71 squadron around September 1st or end uh, of August? Very early, the, the, last of, uh, uh, the last of August, beginning of September. Yeah. And you already had time in the Spitfire, correct? Yeah. So yeah. was it a big change to switch oh, from? Oh my god, yeah. <coughs> it was a big change to go from the P-51A to the Spitfire? Oh, wonderful. I, mean, I have no difficulties, of course. But you know, it's interesting. In OTU, I, had, I flew uh, P-51As, P-40s, and Hurricanes. And uh, when this uh, RAF guy with 16 victories from the Battle of Britain checked me out in the Hurricane, I came back, you know, and said, how do you like the Hurricane? Oh, I said, the best aircraft I can go. Oh, he said, great, can you fly the Spitfire? And he was really right. The Spitfire was a dream. At that time, you see, the mission of the, of the 71 squadron was uh, convoy patrols and rhubarb missions. You see, the, the, uh, the Americans had not really begun to arrive with their B-17s yet. Uh, and we used to escort, so, say, four or five B-26s, RAF B-26s, you know, close to France and then come right back. And a rhubarb mission is escorting the short-range so, dual-engine yeah, fighters. Straking targets on the ground, and of course, we were hitting locomotives. Okay, and now the, I know, I mean, it's, it's written in your book, and I've seen it other places, there's Ramrod, there's rhubarb, there's convoy oh, yeah. patrol. Different, those are different missions, yeah. yeah. Ramrod is the heavy, he's going all the way. Oh, right, yeah. Okay. Uh, now the... the. Um... Oh, no, I had no victories whatsoever, but I had uh, five or six locomotives. I destroyed about six locomotives. No, straight. Is it just like you see in the movies where they just blow up? Oh, and... yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. But that's and, kind you of... know, one thing the RAF, you know, uh, taught me when I went through OTU, was that uh, when you are strafing a target on the ground, you don't pull back to get away. You know, you just drop down and fly below three top levels to get away from the area. That's how they got my friend uh, Gabby Gabreski. Oh, Gabby, after they took some bombers, you know, to a target east of Frankfurt, they decided to hit the deck. And my God, he said, they run into an aerodrome loaded with JU-88s and all sorts of aircraft. And uh, old Gabby, he came along and he clubbed one of the J-28s while parked, you know, somewhere at the aerodrome. And then he pulled up to make a, another turn to come up for a second. And that's how they got Gabby. Now, when did you transition into the P-47? Uh, in early 1943. I would say January, February of 43. And now what was that like to fly the P-47? You know, it was really hard at the very beginning, you know. we. 
Well, to give you an idea, you know, when you fly an aircraft that, like the Spitfire, 7,000 pounds, and all of a sudden you convert to a 14,000 pound aircraft, it was really, uh, you know, we couldn't accept the goddamn thing. But then we began to realize that the P-47 was not really a fighter like the Spitfire at low altitudes. The P-47 was a good fighter in high altitude. Did you have the four-bladed prop when yeah, you started? It, yeah. You had the four-bladed prop. Yeah. Okay. So what the aircraft had, it had that supercharger that it came in at about 20-something thousand feet. And at 35,000 feet, it was magnificent. In fact, even General Galant, when I met General Galant at La Rousse in 1986, 87, uh, we talked about that. And he says, ah, he says, we found out about the Thunderbolt. And I told my pilots to avoid engaging them in high altitude. But below, say, 22, 23,000 feet, you were a dead duck. The P-47 was not there. Yeah, though, I mean, we have had successes with guys shooting down. My roommate, Dan Tontelli, he got two FW-190s on the deck while flying a P-47. Well, what year was that, though? Uh, was that after that you? That was when I was down in Paris, in France, rather. Uh, when I came back to Depton in September of 1944, uh, of, uh, I was told, you know, that uh, my roommate had returned home, by the way, uh, at that time. But he was involved in a fight, you know. He sat down two f 90s uh, with the goddamn P-47 on the deck. Well, the, re uh, the reason I was asking that is because the skill level of the average German pilot was dropping pretty fast towards the end of the war. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, there weren't many that were still. <laughs> yeah, the thing at the latter part, even even you know, on the on the first escort uh, mission to Berlin, uh, I I did not get involved with anything. But some of the uh, guys from the Fort Fighter Group encountered some uh, Germans, and uh, and they said they had a little difficulty, you know. But the fact that there were so many of us, uh, you know, with the P-51 then at the time. Uh, the Germans, you know, uh, you know, did not really try to uh, to engage us. I just—it's hard to believe that 35,000 feet, that any kind of a hard turn, you think you would just bleed off your airspeed so fast. Uh, I mean, I I flew F4s, and I know you flew F4s yeah, yeah. too, and the F4 would hardly even fly at 35,000 feet. It, you know, it was it was it was meant for a low altitude airplane. Oh, yeah. You could turn like crazy at low altitudes, but at high altitudes, yes. we used to dogfight with the F-102s over in Germany, and they would clean our clock. They wouldn't come down low. <laughs> just stay I, flew, I flew the F-102 and the 106, by the way, too. And I, uh, I agree with what you were saying. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, I've, I've, I've seen pictures of you standing on the 102. I flew also, when I was at right field, I had a chance to fly the Emmy 109, the FW-190, and the Emmy-262. And when I drove Galan, you flew the 262? How did they, now, why did the British have the P 51 B, uh, A's? Well, originally, originally <coughs> the British government, the RAF, was looking for a fighter aircraft for strafing. Right. Army cooperation uh, uh, work. And they didn't want to, of course, uh, why, why, would you, why would you pick a liquid cooled airplane to do that? Well, that's the question, of course, you know, because uh, as you mentioned, liquid cooled, like Spitfire or 51, if you get a bullet in the glyco, you're dead. Whereas in the P 47, we got a P 47 in the fourth fighter group later on when I joined the group, came back from a mission with all the Kali, plus two cylinders, out of commission. The, the Kali was just blown off during strafing at uh, locomotives. And then the Germans, you know, had begun to uh, arm the caboose, the last car there, you know, with uh, at the aircraft guns, and mm -hmm. that's how they hit the sky. So we changed our policy or our ways, you know, trying to get the locomotive. And it was ideal for strafing. You know, that's the thing. Okay, let's see. So you referred so often to Pecton Squadron. P-E-C-T-I-N, what does that mean? Uh, Pecton? Mm -hmm. Pecton was the call sign. So you, my you, number was 39, Pectron 39, and that was really but you didn't your, you didn't change it then? Your, uh, for each, every so often they would, they would, yeah. Okay. Later on, I think after I went down in France and I came back, I did it. 
they have changed, if I'm not mistaken, you might be smoky, something different. Every so often, depends on the intelligence, you know, they're the guys who right, right, decide right. when to change that. I took, I took part with 800 bombers. How do you... Okay. What do you, how do you... Okay, uh, now, there are different boxes for the bombers, okay? And the groups, the groups, one group, say, protecting this box, another group protecting that box. Now, that doesn't mean that all 800 bombers go into the same target. You see, after they reach a point, they break up and they go to different targets. And so how did, but you would rendezvous, you, you would take off flights of two or four at the same time? Two at the same time. Two at the same Formate time. Formate over our base and then proceed to the rendezvous point. 15 second intervals between flights? Yeah. Something like that? Yeah, we, we had established a system where we would put a flagman at the beginning of the runway while the aircraft would line up behind the two. Give the signal to the two guys after they roll down the runway and just before they become airborne, give the signal to the second two guys. And the fourth fighter group, let me say this, we got the record of becoming airborne as a group in less than two minutes. Wow. How many airplanes? Well, uh, 48, first 48, and then we ended up with uh, 75 uh, P-47s. And we still did the same thing. We had really the record. So did you fly in, uh, you flew in more of a spread formation, fingertip but spread yeah. out, I suppose. 100 yards apart, something like oh, that? No, no, closer than that. No, oh, closer than that. Okay. And then you, you would fly uh, with the bombers. It's, it's basically just a stream of bombers. Yeah, correct. With the bombers, you see, we would take a position above <coughs> the bombers. Never on this, well, a few times on the side, but normally the escort, you know, began above the bombers. And uh, Blexley, you know, would say, okay, it, uh, uh, Spectrum Squadron, uh, take your position here, the other squadron there, and so on. How fast were the bombers going? Uh, the bombers, uh, we had to slow down a little bit, you know, cut down the power because they would travel about maybe 300 close miles per hour. And of course, formation tactics would always change, you know. For example, when the Germans began to attack the B-17s in an um, attack. Uh, and I, I really uh, discussed that with uh, Galan. When I met him, the, the, the objective here was to kill, to, to attack the bomber formation from the IP point to the target, when the, BC, the bombers, you know, have come very close to each other, very, very close, so they can drop the bombs, you know, on the target. So the aim was to kill the pilots on the leading B-17 or bomber, where, and then after that has happened, that aircraft would go out of uh, flying and collide with the, with the next aircraft, either to the left or to the right. And we saw, I saw with my eyes, over Hamburg, B-17s, you know, as we were approaching to protect them over the target area, they were being attacked by, from the both, no, no attacks. And uh, evidently they must have hit both pilots and the Gardan B-17 collided with the other B-17 to its left and then the one to the left collided with the other one. Three B-17s going down in flames. The B-17s always carried two 50 caliber machine guns. The B-24 at the beginning had only one. Then when they saw that the Germans were attacking, they added a second. You see, the Germans, you know, would, would make the attack now from way up high, okay? And they coming down in so tremendous, head on, so tremendous speed, you know, that I don't think the gunners had the time in seconds, microseconds, in fact, you know, to gain position, try to get a shot at the air, uh, attacking aircraft. So, so when the Germans would attack from the front, and then they would pass through, what did they do? Roll upside down and then dive away? Straight down. Do a split S or? Try, we would try to catch them and no way. No way. I mean, the guy would just go to infinity. But what uh, Blexley, you know, began to do, okay, what we're going to do, we're going to put a section of fighters way up high ahead of the bombers. So to prevent any Germans from coming down. Oh, wow. If they did, we'll just intercept it. And that's when the, uh, the Luftwaffe changed the uh, attacking. I intercepted an ME-109 and at 30, 30 something thousand feet. And I tried to really 
get on his tail close enough to Safari. But this guy was dancing and at the same time was really descending, descending. I said to myself, what in the hell he's trying to do? You know, finally we got on the deck. And my God, what happened? This was uh, on the western part of Germany, uh, east of uh, Belgium, way, way east of Belgium. So what happened? This guy went under the high tension wires and as I was approaching that from the sight of my eyes, I spotted the two towers of the high tension wires, then it dawned on me what he had in mind. He went on, he knew the area, he went under, and he felt that I would crash on the goddamn wires, and that was it. And I barely pulled up, I was flying the P-47, by the way. I barely pulled up, missing the top cable of the wires there. And uh, I got him on the other side. He kept the mistake he made, you know, he thought that I would really uh, crash back there. And he just kept on flying straight, you know, and I opened up with my old P-47. But the P-47 would outrun those airplanes at, at low altitude. Oh, uh, it was at, it was at a higher top well, speed. Not exactly. We would outdive the FW-190 and also the ME-109. I had an ME-109 on my tail one time, you know, and the, the, this guy was clever. I thought he was going to really get me. And my God, I did everything and he still, you know, was on my tail. What really saved me after I dove down and I, I, I came up at the deck of the lower overcast. I got in, I pulled up and I got into the clouds and that's how I got away from the guy. Well, we've we've lost we've lost our uh, we've lost talking about the Eagle Squadrons, but in, I've noticed in everything I've read, it sounds like it's always supposed to. The advice is wingman is supposed to stay, two is supposed to stay with one, four is supposed to stay with three, but as soon as the combat starts, it all goes to hell. <laughs> Normally, the rule was that you know the number two will protect the number one while he is attacking. Absorb the, the bullets same, from the... the same, right? <laughs> but if you attack, say, and I, I had the situations, if you attack uh, four or five enemy aircraft, you know, you don't stay in formation, you break up and try to uh, do anything. But if the number one, if the, if, they, if the two aircraft spotted an enemy aircraft, the number one is making the attack. The number two is supposed to watch his tail to make sure that no one is above up there, you know, because the Germans used to pull shenanigans. They would fly, say, up in high altitude, they would see Americans down below, so what they would do? Send one single fighter down to deploy and force the Americans to chase him, and once they got in position, then they would dive and hit him. Yeah. What's the highest you ever went in the Mustang? Uh, close to 40. Yeah, but you know, you had to force the aircraft to get up there. Yeah. And it was, uh, the flying was not really like, you know, 30,000 or 20. Just yeah. staggering along. Yeah, yeah, you, you were able to tell that the machine was not really. No, is I, I noticed from reading that the P 51 you flew and eventually crashed, and the P 47 you flew both had QPD on the side. Why, why QPD? Was that something. Well, uh, First of all, let me say this, when we transferred from the RAF into the Air Force, we kept our Spitfires. In the Spitfire I had sharing with Vic France was extra K. Okay? Then we kept on sharing that uh, Spitfire until we got the P-47s. Now, the P-47s, of course, began to arrive and uh, assigned to the different pilots. Then when my aircraft was assigned, they, they came up with QPD. Period. Then when we converted from P-47s to P-51s, it was just logical, you know. The 51 assigned to Pisanos, you know, put the letters QPD. So in other words, it was a squadron decision. Squadron, yeah, squadron decision and squadron markings that it did not change because we changed aircraft. So in other words, when you got the P-51, so you, so other people would know who was flying what, you could just look at the airplane exactly. that was in it. Because you exactly. couldn't read the name on it, obviously. Exactly. Oh, how interesting. Now, the, um, when you transition from the P50, uh, P-47 to the P-51, you'd already flown the P-51. Yeah, I had no, I, actually I became an instructor, you might say, you know, to help other guys, you know, to check out. But the first mission you flew, wasn't it, I mean, I, I heard you say once before that the first mission you flew, you were learning how to fly the P-51 at the same time. Who, who was it, was it Blakesley was the commander at that yeah, point? Yeah, and, and And basically, didn't he just tell the air staff or whoever it was, We'll learn to fly them 
Give me 30 days, we'll all be checked out. But yeah. Well, you know, uh, Blexley was taken away from the fourth group one time to help another fighter group. I think it was the 357 or another uh, 51 group that they had arrived from the States. And uh, Blexley fell in love with the aircraft. And then uh, he told uh, Kepner, General Kepner, a fighter commander, General, we were flying 347s at the time. General, I want 351s. And the general said, Don, I can't do that. We have the uh, week that is coming, you know, for a full blast, you know, over Germany, and I cannot take you off operations, you know, to train on the march time. He says, you don't have to take us off operations. We flew the Spitfire, you know, and we know exactly, you know, what the rolls for the engine, you know, is all about. You give me 50 watts and I promise you I'll be up in the air in 24 hours. No, Don, I can't do that, General I kept me told uh, Blexley. I got about a few days or maybe 10 days later, oh, this is what Blexley was telling us. General Kepner called him up and said, Don, that promise you made about you'll be ready in 24 hours, is it still on? He said, you bet. That's when we began to get 51s. Well, I remember you said you taxied into your parking place the P-47, there's a P-51 sitting across from you. Yeah, correct. So how many hours do you think ended up in the P-47? Uh, in the P-47, I, myself, you yeah. mean? Oh, I would say over 100 hours. So, but how many, so how long, you must have flown it for about a year. Quite a bit. We flew it quite a bit, yeah. Almost we would fly almost every day. Well, I think we converted uh, to B 47s uh, April 1943. Okay? And we kept that until February 1944 when we got the 51s. So we, uh, we have flown the P 47 quite a bit. And so you didn't have that many missions in the P 51 then? No, correct. Uh, myself, I think I could play about uh, four or five missions. Did you have any uh, aerial victories in the P-47? The P-47, I had six. Six, okay. And four with the monster. Wow. And did, so were there a gun camera film of, 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 all, of all those? Yeah. I wonder where that gun camera film is. Well, I, I don't know, but the, the, the last uh, four that I got over Bordeaux, which my friends uh, confirmed, uh, Hively and uh, Peterson, uh, of course, the camera was with the aircraft, you know, when I crash landed in France. But it was confirmed by those two guys that I had four victories. I left Bordeaux by myself. Over the months, my engine began to act funny. You see, at that time, you know, we had problems. On the first Berlin escort mission, we lost four 51s, engine failure. You see, they sent the first batch of 51s, which we got, the P-51B, without spark plugs. And fighter command wanted to get the aircraft up in the air, so we decided they decided to put Spitfire plugs, Rolls Roy engine Spitfire plugs on the American built uh, Spit, uh, Rolls Roy built engine. Well, that was good for about uh, five, six, seven, eight hours. As I said in the first Berlin escort mission on the 3rd of March 44, it was four guys, engine failure. The plugs were not really uh, suitable for that engine. It was later on when the, the plugs from America began to arrive and the problem was solved. But uh, on the way back, in my case, on the 5th of March, over the months, my engine was acting, bagging, and vibrating. <coughs> and I knew, I said, God damn it, the plugs, you know, would probably let me down. As I was approaching overly hard, you know, that's what I had engine failure. The Germans, in the meantime, had opened up their eye hack and I felt that with a better engine, I can't reach the channel, you know, far enough to bail out, so I turned back. So I decided, I decided because, you know, the intelligence guys, you know, would uh, tell us to do not bail out at high altitude because if there are gunners on the ground, they're going to practice on you, like they used to do with the B-17 boys. So I decided about 2,000 feet would be just perfect. So at 2,000 feet now, dead engine, I, after I decided to turn around and fly south, well, what airspeed? Uh, what? What airspeed? Oh, I would say about uh, less than 200. You know, I got a dead engine. And the problem was just uh, at, uh, turning very slowly, but no power whatsoever. I was at 22,000 feet when the engine flew. And I decided at about 5,000 feet, I better get ready and jump at 2,000. So, so what, what, what was the actual landing speed in a, in a P-51? Landing speed on a 51, I was at 95 to 100. 
Was the fuel measured in gallons or pounds? Oh, gallons. Gallons. Look at gallons. And external did... tanks. And of course, we always started the engine and operated from the fuselage tank. And before takeoff, the gang load all switches for fuel from the external tanks first, keep on filling the fuselage tank, and then once the external tanks are empty, it goes into the wing tanks and so on. So, well, how, did you, how did you know when it was time to return? Uh, when uh, you had used your wing tanks, internal wing tanks, and you were operating the fuselage tank 90 gallons, it was time to come home. 90 gallons would take you how far? Any idea? Well, not, not too far. Enough to cross the English Channel. Okay. Yeah. But I mean, you know, several times you knew you were low on fuel. Apparently there's a fuel light that would but come see, on. We had two types of uh, drop tanks. We had uh, first we started with 75 gallons and then they went to 100, 100 gallons, I think, then 125. This is the P47 or the? the no, the P51. Now, to give you an idea, when I was down in France, the fourth group escorted the bombers from England to Berlin and from Berlin to the Soviet Union. Right. So nine hours of flying time. They had the big external tanks and fuselage tanks and of course the, and the wing tanks. But they made it to the Soviet Union, so eight hours something. But they were jettisoning their tanks as they ran out of gas. Oh yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. And you apparently jettisoned your tanks before you Oh yeah. Crash landed in yeah, the field. Yeah, well, unless you knew, you knew that uh, there was no engagement, you know, the guy says save the tanks and bring them home. And the and tanks were made of paper, weren't they? Yeah. Cardboard or something or other? Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, it was uh, It was made in England. Yeah, it was some special, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, it was not uh, fully metal. I think at the beginning they began to do that and they ran into some problems. And they felt this would be lighter but durable. And a thousand feet, I released the canopy and uh, and uh, I, uh, I prepared myself and uh, I uh, took the safety belt off. And then at about 2,000 feet, I tried to stand. I had I had trimmed the aircraft nicely and really standing very nicely with the dead engine. Then I, I tried to stand up there and then I noticed the core for my uh, dinky that I, I should have connected to the May West. I have not. So overboard got stuck somewhere. Because when I got up there, you know, I said, "Good Lord!" You know, I tried to get the goddamn thing, and I couldn't really release the goddamn thing. And here I am, you know, I go to the ground. I said, "Sit down." So I sat down back in the cockpit, and I played around with it. Finally, it came loose. I connected it to the main west, you know, and I stood up again, and I got out on the wing, and I was just about to slide, and then pull the deal. And my God, I looked to my left, and I can see carbon all over the place. And then I knew that I was too bad down though. Then I thought for a moment, get back in the cockpit, but then I thought with my parachute down, you know, I wanted to really destroy the goddamn stick and probably go straight down. Oh, oh. So that's why I stood right there. And the funny part was the aircraft was coming up over a goddamn barn. I remember a red barn. I was just coming over the goddamn roof and I thought I was gonna hit the roof. And I reached inside and I pulled the stick back a little bit, barely missed the goddamn the top of the barn. And then on the other side of the barn, the right, since I had killed some of my spear, the right wing evidently hit the ground first, and I was thrown away from the gun and stop uh, prop. So how fast do you think you were going when you hit oh, the ground? Oh, I would say about 90 plus. Well, you were lucky you weren't hurt what, badly. What saved me, you know, was the, the right wing to hit the ground and move the aircraft a little bit to the right, and I was thrown. Just barely, I remember, you know, going, I closed my eyes when I spotted the, the two blades. Oh. Uh, the, the four blades that were stuck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Fire Races Association had a reunion here back in uh, the end of 70, beginning of 80 or so, at uh, Miramar. And uh, they had an ex well, the reunion was in town, but they had an exhibition at uh, at the Miramar, where Bob Hope was invited to this, and there was old General Doolittle sitting up there too. And uh, I told my wife, I said, I'm going to say hello to the general. But, uh, well, she said, you can't bother him. I said, come on, I met the guy. I said, a long time ago. So I went up there in the front of the general, saluted, you know, I said, General, you might not remember me, I'm Colonel Steve Pisanos, the fourth fighter group. I said, I didn't. He said, I remember you, you are the fellow with the accent. 
and of course uh, he, you know, got uh, involved in some scraps uh, here and there, and uh, he disappeared, you know, when I joined the uh, the 71 Eagle Squadron, and uh, I did not know him until he came here to San Diego, and I met him here at the museum, and uh, he was really a hard-working guy, and uh, I helped him in uh, trying to bring the Spitfire that you saw here at the museum. What did, uh, where did he go after the Eagle Squadron so were absorbed into the Air Force, Army Air Corps? Uh, what, what, where did he go? I mean, he, he was in 133, where did he go? Okay, he went to another squadron. He did not come to the 4th Fighter Group. Uh, uh, I, I think he was one of those uh, Americans who decided, some of them decided to stay, like uh, Jimmy Gray in my squadron. He didn't want to transfer. He wanted to stay in the RAF. And Jesse went to another squadron, and that's where I lost track of him until we met here in San Diego. But you and he worked together to get the Spitfire for the museum, is yes, that right? correct. And correct. what year was that? Oh, this was back in the 80s. I remember when the, the McKellar was the director of the museum here, and uh, we came along and we told him that we'd like to make the museum our home. And uh, he said, so oh, you're welcome, and so on, and they built this room to, this person here, as you can see, and uh, he said, "Gee, it would be nice, you know, if we, if we really uh, can get a Spitfire, you know, for the museum." So then the Eagle Squadron Association, Jesse Taylor, myself, and others, you know, composed a letter and uh, we sent it to the Air Ministry and uh, told them that we have to establish a home here and we don't have a, a Spitfire for the museum. And I got got a letter from uh, an Air Vice Marshal from the Air Ministry and says, uh, we do have a Spitfire for you boys, but we need a favor. We need a Mustang for the Handler Museum. So it was then where we had to really scrounge uh, here and there and ask for help and all of us contributed to begin to buy parts. We found the fuselage of the Mustang in one place, the two wings at another place, and then uh, the engine and the propeller at another place, and, uh, and uh, we decided, you know, to put that all together. And uh, I remember, you know, even Fred Smith of Federal Express uh, helped us uh, with money, and uh, we finally got enough money to put a Mustang together. And uh, my God, that Mustang was was flown by uh, Federal Express to England. And then they wrote the speed fire.